Michael Lydiard, welcome to Over the Bonnet. Thanks, mate. Much appreciated. Tell me about a typical day at work for you when you're working as an occupational therapist. What do you get up to? Um, well, generally, you know, there's obviously a lot of administration, you know, linking in and tying in with um, insurers, making contact and building rapport with insurers and the clients. Um, when we're not doing that, it's about trying to build on their function in everyday life, um, even if that's through assessments or um, trying to build on, you know, what adaptions they require or modifications um, through providing assistive technology or just building on basic interventions to help them feel like they're achieving their life uh, goals. Is that important? A hundred percent. You know, everyone, I think people can forget at times, depending on their physical and psychological health, that they can forget the meaning of goals. Um, you know, everyone has their own diversity and their levels of, you know, um, difficulty. So, you know, trying to ensure and identify short-term and the long-term goal helps them to drive towards their own change. What sort of people are you dealing with when you're working with them? Um, look, you know, it's, it's a, a wide category, you know, and when I say category, I'm talking about cultures, personalities, um, you know, and it's multiple, multiple. You know, because you're not just looking at one person, you're looking at the whole person. And to look at the whole person, you look at that the individual, the client you're working with, but generally they have a, a son, a daughter, they've got a wife, um, and they sometimes got parents and so forth. So you've got to work around their dynamics as well. But generally, you know, I'm working with people from defence, veterans, um, people that are out at work with Telstra or the NAB, um, or have had injuries, you know, and work cover want us to help and get them back into the workplace or identify more suitable roles for them. When you're dealing with someone, what are you looking for, though, when you're trying to ascertain how to help them? It's hard. I, I guess it's really about building rapport and helping them to understand that you have their best interests at heart. Um, having empathy and understanding their story, because obviously there's a lot of medical history, not along with the history that's there. They're obviously so most of the time getting a lot of medical help. Um, so it's about, you know, really understanding what they are going through, what their challenges are and the balance of. So it's about listening, but also obviously being observant as well, because, you know, when you start looking at pain behaviors, you know, sometimes they will tell us, you know, we have this certain pain and there's certain clues that will let us, yes, you are right, or might be slightly different. So as I sit there and talk, I'm being observant and observing, you know, the body language, listening to the tone of speech, taking in what's happening around in the environment. So he might say that he doesn't like sitting outside or sitting in public, but we could be out in the public and there's people walking in and out and he's not affected. So you're observing what he is saying and listening to it, but taking in a in in um, you know what's happening around because generally people with PTSD will sit with the back towards a wall they'll be facing out people that are depressive will be looking down not maintaining on eye contact and so forth and then there's that body language or you know behaviors there you know the sighing deeply the you know the agitated uh, and so forth so you, there's a lot to take in and trying to build on that conversation and reassure them that you aren't I'm empathetic, you do understand where they're coming from, but also reassure them what, what they're doing is correct, I know, right, and where and how we can help build forward or move forward. As an occupational therapist, what's bigger, the injury or the recovery? I don't think there is anything that's better. I think because everyone is unique and everyone is an individual, the injury will impact the person, you know, at different levels and different um, impacts of their life. If we were to say, you know, lumbar spondinosis, which is deterioration, you know, of the lumbar, you know, it affects people different ways. In the, in the military, it is brought on earlier because of heavy weighted loads um, where they can't carry packs or can't, you know, do repetitive movements and so forth. So when we look at that and understand their condition, well, we need to build and reassure them that the pain that they feel is, you know, is present is there you know we can't tell them that what you're feeling is not pain but what we can try to ensure them is that you know what you are feeling and try to get them to help them to understand that pain is part of life um, and it's hard to concept you know in my in my experience I've still got pain but for me to live a quality of life I manage my pain through different strategies and I've got to be open and be willing to talk to people um, and adapt my 
lifestyle around the pain to fit my accomplishments. So it's about building hope and then building, you know, on the goals through good choices, but also supportive choices where they can see the value of change. Someone that has always been blind as opposed to someone that's blinded, they have a different take on it. Now, the deterioration that you talk about as opposed to a traumatic injury, do you notice much difference between the two? Yeah, I do. And um, not talking about my personal experiences where I lost you know, limbs in sight from a, a traumatic event. Uh, I can recall I have a, a military friend that became blind from his service and I've been work I had been working with a client that was born blind or got degeneration of his um, optical nerve and, and so forth. And the intake is totally different. So the gentleman that was a veteran that's lost life and he you know he had you know he had sight, he, he knew what was going on. He um, got out about and had to learn how to adapt. The gentleman that had deterioration of the retina and, and so forth, he had time to learn, you know, and he's adapted and, and so forth. But his perception to life is way different to the gentleman that was a veteran that was dramatically given to him where he had to learn directly and quickly and so forth. So there is a difference, and that's what I mean. Everyone's got that unique story. Um, the gentleman with the, the veteran, you know, he had to accept, and this is what the I think a lot of context can be lost. Um, you know, he couldn't drive anymore. He couldn't make a cup of tea and, and so forth. Where the gentleman that, you know, had the retina um, deterioration, you know, he was gradually supported and you know, there was someone always there willing to help him and give him that, which can be a barrier and not let them be an individual. Um, where that other the veteran just had to learn directly quickly and didn't understand the terms of support, how to ask for support. Is it too much to ask for this support here now and then, you know, where the other gentleman just learned to accept it? How important is that support from family, friends and people around you when you're dealing with these things? I think it can be uh, underestimated at times, the value of family and friends. Uh, in the fact that care or strain is a huge effect because the family or friends want to give help. But at the same time, the individual wants to be independent. They want to be seen normal. They want to be acting normal. So to constantly be given support and constantly to you know, say, we're here to help you, it needs to be allowed to let them either fail or try to understand the feeling of success. Um, so... To have the support of family is very important, not just physically, but psychologically and emotionally for the fact that they know there's someone there. Uh, in my circumstances, you know, I'm grateful, you know, I've got my 12-year-old son that sits with me or, you know, lives with me. Um, I call upon him, you know, at times where I am physically, psychologically and emotionally drained, strained from working with my own difficulties, where I will ask him, mate, can you do up? you know, my top button, mate, can you help me roll up a sleeve? So there's times where we seek help because we're fatigued. Um, and, and that's anyone with an injury, you know, someone with a back or leg injury, they want to be getting back out and norming, but because it's so draining and it's draining on them emotionally, they will seek help. Um, so having that support is always critical. When you don't have the support, that is when we see relapse or when we see that you know people start thinking of suicide ideation because it could just be a matter of support being talking to someone it could be visually just being able to touch and people forget the importance of touch you know being able to have someone close to you just to put your hand on your shoulder hand on your thigh to say you're doing well everything's okay can be so empowering at the same time um, you forget the importance of it is there care of fatigue though 100%. Uh, vicarious trauma, you know, that's when, you know, if I was talking to a veteran, he talks about his symptoms of overseas service, it might bring something onto me because it might remind me of my service and it'll bring up my PTSD or bring up my depression. So not only do you need to be weary of who you talk to and so forth, but depending on the level of care, the level of support you need, and that's why we have respite, you know, to allow the carer, the supports to have time to reflect and have their own self-love, um, to have their own time to care for themselves. So carers, families, children need to be still 
you know, be reminded they are there for a loving relationship and they need that time to build upon it. And we sometimes during injuries and, you know, we need to make sure that we build on those relationships because a lot of time is focused on the injured person and building on the medical management and building on them getting to work players or building them just to have um, an everyday life where the family can be lost and they're not building on a loving and, you know, and passionate relationship. So like when you asked before, you know, you know, who, who's involved, it, it's the whole dynamic involves more than one person. Um, and for someone to feel have self-worth and to someone to have, you know, self-identity, it is about identifying the whole dynamics and who's important to them and how to build on that. How can family and friends best help then someone that is going through what you're describing? Being an occupational therapist to me isn't hard. Maybe it's because of the lessons that I've learned and what I've been through. Um, it is about, you know, hearing them. And there's a, you know, not just listening, but really understanding what they're going through. And it's difficult because sometimes we, or the injured person or you know, the child doesn't know how to express it. Um, so it is important in the fact that, you know, that not only do you hear and you try to give them the level of support, but you also try have to try to give them that level of independence. Like I said, to succeed and at the same time to fail. And there's nothing wrong with failing. Because it's a tough balancing act. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And that's what I mean. I've learned more through failing than succeeding. You know, through failure, you build self-confidence and then you get back up again. And then, you know, that's where you get your resilience from, you know, from learning and building back up. You might get knocked down, but then you get back up. So through failure, you do get success and you learn your own strengths and you learn your weaknesses. So, you know, sometimes it is very hard and it's hard, especially if you're a mother and father, if you have a son or daughter that has a diagnosis or has a condition that you want to be helping with, you want to be doing the shoelaces up, you want to be, you know, helping them get dressed. But what's more important, giving them the fundamentals of how to be independent, to live life fully and to enjoy, to appreciate being able to do it yourself. How hard is it, though, to get back up, though, when you do fail? Once again, it's it's in the uh, up to the individual. You know, there's so many circumstances that can keep someone down. You know, your physical health is impacted by your mental health and vice versa. You know, your mental health is impacted by your physical. You know, so as soon as you knock down, you know, and you you know you're given a diagnosis, which I refer to a label, um, because a lot of the times you're given a diagnosis and people understand what that condition is and people have perceptions, people perceive that, oh, I have PTSD, I have depression. I class it as a label because when you have that, you seem to stick to it <laughs> and you seem to try to, you know, like I understand what PTSD is. I have it. I have depression. But as soon as you say, oh, you've got depression, PTSD, it can be used against you. But because I understand what it is and I try to deal with my own life through PTSD and depression and anxiety, I try to make sure I pick on the positives of it. So to me, there's always positives in PTSD. In the depression, it's hard to find you know, positives, but the positives I need to get out and find someone. I needed to find something to do. So the you know, the failure is me not doing something, but the positive is trying to get out to do it. So it's about self rewarding, self reinsuring yourself again that it's hard, but it is achievable. How do you reward yourself though when you're being positive and you're doing these personal goals? It's about recognizing what you've achieved and where how far you've come, you know. Um, you know, I've got a, a lot of clients and it, it's easy to sit there um, and listen to society. You know, people have depression, people have, you know, these diagnoses and, and things like that. But, you know, when you look at someone with depression, PTSD or anxiety, you know, it's hard to get out into into, into shopping centers. It's hard to get out and just to do everyday things, especially if you've got chronic depression and things like that, or you don't know how to talk to people and how to open up to them. So the success is... I've, I've been able to get out to the shops today. You know, I've been able to, you know, take two steps to the mailbox or, you know, the, it's a small step, but it's a good step. You know, the, the feelings and thoughts that come associated with it are impacting on us, in, you know, personally, but you've got to recognise and accept that you made an achievement. 
and you need to keep building on that achievement. Is it harder though to push those boundaries when you've got a problem as opposed to someone that most people aren't used to pushing their boundaries? Yeah. And when they have some sort of trauma, how hard is it to learn that having to push the boundaries is part of life now? Well, you know, I guess the best thing, the way to explain it is we have a fear-based mind and the fear-based mind is like a, a negative concept. You know, I, I don't want to jump off a cliff or I won't jump off a cliff or I won't fall from a chopper or I won't, I don't want to do something that's outside my boundaries. But when you achieve it, you go, wow, that was, you know, insightful. It was thrilling, you know, so to be un, being able to get over those, you know, barriers is just, yeah. What's your biggest fear? Mine. Yeah. Uh, losing sight. Uh, not having a loving relationship. Losing my children. Yeah. That seems like pretty normal fears, though, other than your sight, of course. But uh, I think um, the rest of it seems pretty normal. Yeah. But once again, it comes down to the context. You know, you look at um, my life course, my life um, changes. Um, you know, I sit here in front of you with, you know, loss of limbs, you know, hearing impaired, visually impaired, and I have learnt to appreciate life for what I have from what I've been through. At the same time, you know, I've made a lot of changes to move to Brisbane that have impacted on me and my family, you know. Um, so it's nothing's ever easy, nothing. You know, and the, the, it's funny, we, we talk about people clients families and we talk about a condition but when you start talking about people with you know complex situations or uh, cases you know in my case you know i have physical and sensory issues um, conditions um, and we can over analyze them um, and like we're talking about you know you know we have a fear ba fear-based mind you, you know yes i have these conditions and that's where we've got to try to you know, have that mindset to turn it over and have that behavior where we can go, these are the positives of it. I get to live today, you know, a Nero hack as they call it, you know. I get to see my son come home, you know. I get to go to work, you know. I get to go for a cycle. I get to, because there's a lot of people that don't get to cycle. So it's about changing that fear-based mind, especially in my complex situation, where I can get to do it. It's a big thing to know what your biggest fears are. A lot of people, don't know that well it's funny you, you you ask what's my biggest fear you know and i said yeah loss of sight you know not being able to see my kids and things because they are very personal to me from the the from what i've seen through life from where i've been from my losses they are my biggest things i'm not fearful of death i'm not fearful of you know snakes or anything like that i'm not fearful of that my fear is not being able to give my children the opportunity to see me for who I am because of my losses. I know who I was, my children know who I had been, but it's now accepting who I am and trying to have society accept me as well. Because in my circumstances, and Mason can definitely, and my, my other two can definitely vouch for this, when we walk through the community, you are looked at. You are looked at differently, people pass comments, so when we talk about support, that's probably the biggest thing, you know, where we get move into society or different cultures and that, that it all impacts on you strategically. Is that hard? When you ask me that question, there's, there's three stories that come at heads and, and, and they're all different parts of my life. So the first one is, you know, in the early stages after I was wounded and things like that. I remember um, with Mason, my oldest son, Kyron, we were walking through you know, to a soccer game. I think Mason had a soccer game. And as we were walking through these fields and that, I had my two boys with me. I was trying to hold their hand or whatever. And these kids came up and they turned around and well, they were looking at us and they were yelling and they were going, oh, look at you. You've only got one arm. You've only got this. Wow. And I felt ashamed. I wow. felt, you know, lost. And I was angry. So I just turned around and said, Look at you, too bad your parents haven't taught you any fucking manners, you know? Mm. Um, and my boys laughed at it and they said, good on your dad type thing. But I was angry mm. and I was annoyed that it wasn't so much the kids, but the parents didn't say anything. And then, so that was this one scenario. So they were with their parents? 
yeah, well, they were somewhere close by and things like that. So, you know, it, so my life impacts on my children's life, like I just gave an example. So, you know, my fear is my kids being ashamed with me. And I know that, you know, at some point, kids will always be ashamed or don't want to be with their parents. Nothing wrong with that. But in my case, because I look differently physically, uh, facially and all that stuff, I'm more of an, an attraction. The other thing, you know, I remember um, trying to, I was out on a date and I was explaining to this, my partner at the time that, you know, people watch me when I eat, people watch when I do things. And she goes, oh, I think it's all in your head and tight. And we're out on a date. And credit to her, these people were watching me. And then she turned around and said, instead of watching, would you like to ask me questions so we can enjoy this dinner by themselves? You know? <laughs> and then, you know, so carers also get affected like that way as well or partners whatnot and then you know the recent one is when i end up moving down here in brisbane i was um my daughter's four and everything's about building rapport and love and nurturing with your you know your sibling or your kids and i was at a park with her because i want to be seen normal i want to be interacting and i want to be able to do it i want to be seeing it Anyway, um, I was at the local park and I was playing and kids always come up and ask me, oh, what happened and what do you do? And, you know, Is and, that okay when they do that? Oh, it, it honestly doesn't bother me. And my story has always changed in my life course. I think at the beginning, you know, oh, yeah, you know, a shark bit me arm because I, you know, you know, I didn't know how to explain it to people. And then I got more comfortable with myself and how to explain my situation. But this one particular day um i was down there playing with my daughter and you know sometimes you just want to play with your kids you know sometimes you don't even want to listen to kids or you don't want to have people looking at you but you just ignore it and on this particular day i was playing with my daughter ella and um a, a, one of the kids came up and goes oh wow what happened to you and i said oh, i got blown up at work mate you know he goes oh wow that sounds awesome i said oh no not really not really but no no so that's that's what happened anyway the mother came up and said can you not tell my son that and i went sorry really and she said he doesn't need to know that and i went well oh, i'm sorry and turned around to the son and said i was injured in the military and i got my ass handed to me and then i looked at her and i said is that better because there is no way right way to say it um and you know what we, we talk about equality you know, I, I could, you know, people talk about, you know, physical conditions versus mental health conditions, you know, physical conditions you can see, it's the invisible conditions. You know, that's a whole different story. But being put in a position in front of your children, in front of your family, in front of your partners or whatever relationship you have, and being asked, you know, what's wrong with you actually brings about depression and brings back, you know, your symptoms of anxiety, PTSD or whatever. But you've got to be accepting and you've got to develop with it and get along with it and overcome the diversity of it. Um, so, you know, I can't say that over my life course, my story, two children and parents have changed. But the thing I can say is when I was at a, going through my um, university as AT is people just need to be upfront. People just need to ask. And the example I give is, you know, I was doing a placement at uh, Townsville Hospital and I was had my supervisor walking along the side of me. Anyway, we're heading back to the office and there's a gentleman off on the deck and he, he was um, in a wheelchair. He had lost one or two legs, bilaterally amputated or unilaterally. Um, lost a leg anyway. We were walking past and I said, hey, mate, how you going? He goes, yeah, good. And we just got in a bit of a chat and to start a bit of the conversation, I said, oh, it looks like you're a bit legless. And he laughed and he goes, oh, you look like you're a bit armless, you know. And, and I, we had a bit of a laugh. We giggled and we kept talking. And then as we kept walking, the supervisor just said, oh, you shouldn't have said that. And I went, but he got something from it. Like when people are afraid to ask questions, when people are afraid to come up and acknowledge someone, that's what hurts. You know, people just want to be seen normal. People would rather you just come up and say, hey, mate, you know, what happened, you know. Um, when I, the very first time I got back to Australia, um, which was the 11th of the 11th, Remembrance Day. Um, there was so much going on, but I eventually a month later got into a, a, a home or a hotel with my wife at the time. And as we were going into the elevator, a cow cocky co came in as well, the elevator as well. And I was blind at the time. And he turned around and goes, holy crap, mate, looks like you've been through war. And I went, literally, 
Mm. And it was the best thing because I could just say, I was, mate, you know, and I was able to share, you know, with him. He goes, oh, wow, that, wow, sorry to hear. I said, no, it's all good. It's all good. No, it's fine. But it was just an open, pure conversation with no hidden agenda, no thoughts or anything. He was open. He was interested and he was willing to engage. You know, when people start hiding behind their thoughts and their emotions and because people with losses, you know, sensory can pick up on other sensory issues more quickly than others it hurts you know like i was saying you know you're out on a date and you're observing what's going on you know in my case i've got PTSD. i'm very observant what's happening around me and you see people looking at you or you're walking down the streets with your kids instead of people looking well instead of staring come and you know say something you know don't take my time away from my children by staring at me take my time by asking me a question and then moving on Things have changed and things change over lifespan and they'll probably continue to change how I tell people how I was blown up. But I'll, I'll be honest now. I'm not going to say that a shark took it or anything like that or, yeah. And neither you should. Well, and, and, and I think that's the thing. It's about the person being comfortable with who they are, how the injuries happen and that. And, you know, the community and society, uh, society has changed um, where that, you know, the society and community has become more open to veterans, you know, you know, when you look at the Vietnam era, it's totally different to when we were, you know. Um, and again, you know, from, you know, well, um, the Gulf War to Afghanistan and so forth, it, it has constantly developed. And that's from, because of the good work of the RSL, ECO groups, and, you know, the community being more accepting of, you know, the first responders, the police and the ambulance and that, because they understand that are traumatic events that affect them. Um, so, you know, things do get easier. But, you know, there are individuals and that's what we need to understand. There are individuals that are just individuals that you don't need to know. You don't want to know because they're not going to bring me down. It's your fault. And that example that I used um, with that lady, you know, questioning me in the park, it actually, the strength I found in that was because I had been moved to Brisbane. I said, stuff it, I'm writing a um, blog and I, I put it up on social media because it wasn't just that, because I was trying to get into the dating side of things again. And I tell people who I am, they would go, I don't want anything to do with you. Oh, sorry, this isn't going to work. So really? I get judged based on being open, being very honest and saying, yeah, I, I am passionate. I am lovable. I have feelings. I am normal. But as soon as you're telling you've lost injuries and this has happened, oh, sorry, we don't want to get to know you. So... You know, the park, the dating thing made me drive this blog and I wrote this blog to my community to say, this is who I am. This is what happened. If you see me in the streets, instead of staring, come up and say g'day or at least you know the facts, you know, because it was hurtful. And sometimes we can underplay what hurt is, but emotionally, um, when you look at your feelings and your thoughts, it actually puts you in a down, you know, it, it, it brings you back to a relapse. You know, so that was the strength I got of it. And I felt pride from doing that because once again, I was uncomfortable doing it, but I had to do it, not just for me, but for my children, because I didn't want to keep walking down to that main street or go to that park again to be put in that position. Um, so it was hard, like we we're talking about barriers before, trying to choose what is right and how to take that on for me and how to express myself. Mate, so, it hurts me to hear that you're having to deal with that. Are there some people, though, a percentage of people that go, take you on face value and just go, yep, yeah, you're a good guy? Look, you know, all my friends that know me, they say, oh, wow, you're inspiring. You know, you do so much. And then, you know, I, I left a lot of those friends back in town. So when I've come here and I'm trying to build on a new social group in Brisbane and I have met a lot of these people a lot of people are, tell me your story wow that's incredible you know I used to do a lot of motivational speaking and because of my my mental health has reduced and me trying to prioritize my work and social and my children as a single father I haven't been able to get back into that but I've been able to you know learn who I am and the people that I'm meeting do seem to accept me for who I am and the thing I've had to relearn is the people that don't accept me for face value, well, I don't need them in my life. And I hope that I get to find someone that goes, you know what, yeah, we want to go mountain bike riding. I accept the way that you look. I accept people staring at you or I'm happy to help you, you know. So there are good people out there and that's what I mean. There are individuals out there that I don't want to know because they make 
those comments. Well, if you don't want to know me because I've been honest and up clear um, or the, and you don't want to know how passionate I am and how, you know, um, you know, yeah, passionate I am and how I want to live my life and get out and do things, well, that's your loss, mate. You know, and that's what I mean. When on the dating site, it was two particular women that, you know, ring a bell and I just, and, and there's more, but um, you just accept it, you know, and, and that's what I mean. It's hard and, and that comes back in, you know, you talk about mental health, physical health, you know, oh, it's an invisible um, injury. I understand mental health is invisible, um, but when we look at physical as well, it impacts highly as well on your mental health. Um, and then when you have both, well, yeah, it's more complicated, especially in my job, you know, and that's what I mean. You really got to sit down and understand, you know, the individual, the insurer and try to build on things. So, yeah. You had a conversation in an elevator with a cow cocky and you talked about how you got your injuries. Let's, if we can visit that, how did it all happen? Um, all right. So, um, I was in the army for 20 years, um, I grew up as an army brat, an army brat being someone that, you know, came from an army family. My father was in the military for 21 years. We moved around a lot, so we never really had a home, although I call Ipswich my home because that's where I spent my secondary schooling. Um, at the age of uh, 16, I joined the army, had my 17th birthday down at Kapuka, uh, fortunate enough to get into the core of choice, which was combat engineering. Um, loved that job. Um, from there, I ended up specialising in bomb disposal. Um, did a numerous deployments, and then on my last deployment, which was in Afghanistan as a um, troop sergeant and EOD tech light, you know, we went out on our last, well, my last mission, um, and I had to render safe or attempted to render safe an IED, and um, you know, trying to render safe the IED at the time, I thought, you know, the best way to do it, because I was called what they referred to as a WIT team as well, was to gather intelligence. And I thought I had the time to, you know, exploit the site and gather the intel as I needed. And I thought, you know, I cut what needed to get cut at the time, not to go into too many procedures. Um, but I ended up finding what they call a tech killer or any disturbance switch. And obviously that disturbance switch... Um, you know, initiated the main charge. How does that work, the anti-disturbance switch? How is it, when you're going through the ground, can you describe what you're finding and, and how they set these things up? Yeah, well, I don't want to go into too many procedures because, you know, it's a bit of SOCOM and things like that. But what I can say is when you look at an IED, there's, you know, five components. You know, an IED usually has a battery source, a main charge and a detonator and all this other stuff. Anyway, so when I went in, I, I you know, got rid of the main char or main battery source, which I thought I'd found. I left the main charge and, you know, normal drills kicked in. You've got to, you know, continue exploitation to make sure there's no, you know, secondary devices and there's no other batteries. Um, this anti-disturbance switch was drilled into the T6 mine, which is about six kilos of explosive. I was actually drilled into it. So the, the secondary power source was inside as well. Um, and when I end up going through my exploitation, I initiated that switch. And therefore, the switch had a battery source, which with the battery source was connected to the detonator internal. Um, it initiated, defragated the main charge. So not six kilos went off, but you know maybe one or two went off, which was enough to blow me back. Um, obviously, it blew me back, and I lost my right arm, thumb and index finger on my left hand. I lost my right eye, visually impaired in the left eye. Um, the positive out of that, my number two wasn't on site. You know, he was witness to everything. The three and four, obviously, they were out of harm as well. But the number two, Warren, he was able to give me aid in that. And um, out of the actual incident itself, you know, it, it was it was tough, you know, because when I hit my back or got blown back, I thought everything was normal, you know, adrenaline sat in and it's not what you see on the movies. And I said to Warren, yeah, it's all good, mate. I'll start clearing the way out, you know? And you said, no, st sit where you are and do it, you know, don't move, don't move. And I just sat up and I didn't realize the extent by the time he got to me. Um, I just remember leaning on him. He had been holding my head together and um, it wasn't until 48 minutes later until I got morphine, but before the 48 minutes, um, there wasn't much pain, but I started blacking out because of black blood loss. And for him to keep, I, I remember saying to him, mate, I'm starting to feel pain. And he just said, what well, I said to him, I'm starting to feel pain. I'm going to talk through my foot. 
um, taps and that. And he agreed and we're, I was tapping and tapping and then I must have losing consciousness or something. And he turned around and he started talking about fishing. And I just, I, it just sparked a spark in me and I went, fuck fishing, I hate fishing, you know, it's the worst sport, I can't ever catch it. And it just got the adrenaline and that going again. And he kept talking about me and my sons going fishing and it kept me going. And then we eventually got some morphine and, um, you know, around, you know, an hour or four, the chopper flew in. I remember getting put onto the door. Um, my mate's giving me, you know, I was put onto a door, put into the, the Chinook, or sorry, into the Black Hawk, and then flown back. And when I got put it into the Black Hawk, I remember the downwind. So it's a very, and that was a trigger. And I didn't realize that was a trigger to me until I started working as an OT in, you know, aviation. Um, but then when I landed in, by the time I landed in TK, I, I'd, you know, blacked out and that again. And when I landed in TK, we hit the deck and I came to again and I had a mate, Brian, that pulled me out and he was with me for that time. So, no, I was supported all the way through. And then I was in TK for, I think, 24, 48 hours before I was flown to another place and then I ended up going to Germany. And then in Germany, I was there for a week. And then after that, I was thrown back to Australia, like I said, on the 11th, the 11th um, via Qantas. Um, Massive headlines, obviously, back then because the first seriously wounded regular soldier and all this stuff, a lot of, you know, media and all that, and I had to go on an alias, and then when I landed back into... Why did you have to do that? Well, everyone would want to know about me. Everyone wanted to know what happened, you know, um, and the army had to give me an alias to reduce a lot of, you know, the, the pressure put on the family and myself. And it, it was very emotional because i remember when i got to the hospital Take your time. My, my um brother was there i hadn't seen him and it was just a rush a rush of feelings and that because you know throughout the whole course you know you know from being blown up i, I thought i was going to die and i kept saying to my mates this is what happened you know this is what's happening and so forth you know this is how i blew up this is what happened so i thought i was going to die and i didn't want the mistake to happen again and i wanted you know as wit i wanted them to exploit it further and find, find things out but when i landed in australia um you know i finally got home and i remember i'm breaking down with the Qantas crew thanking them when I got given to Alexander, I remember, wow, I'm, I'm home, I'm settled, you know. But that's when the barriers started happening. And I, I got to hug my brother and I was outside the Alexander Hospital where all the army staff, the nurses were to introduce. And my wife was exhausted at the time. She was, you know, incredible. But she, she was exhausted she had to go away and I didn't know, but I got taken into another room and put into with the nurses and looked after. And then my wife came to me and she said, how are you going? What's happening? And we all, you know, re came back together and I said, how are you going? And she goes, good, but this is what was said. And I went, what? And the chief of army RSM at the time apparently turned around to her and said, look, we don't know how to cope with this. We don't know what to do. This is the first time we've had something like this. And that hurt because I put her in a position where she was lost, where she had no control. I was injured and I had, wasn't able to help her after you had these commanders tell them that. And um, I just remembered, you know, my father coming in saying, you know, we've got all these people willing to support you, help you. And I said, good, I want a meeting in, you know, two days, whatever I said, I want everyone there. I want everyone there. I want the military. I want the doctors there. We're going to sort this out now. Anyway, I called this meeting together and um, reminding everyone that I was blind at the time. I couldn't see anything. And we're all sitting there. And I had my wife, you know, God bless her for the times. Um, and my father sitting there. And I said, all right, everyone knows who I am. Let's go around the circle. And you introduce yourself and what you're going to be willing to provide. You know, this one doctor apparently introduced herself i can't remember if she was standing up or not and she introduced herself as you know the upper limb um pathesis specialist who can give you autobotics and all that and said yeah i'm no doctor whatever this is what my role is but i don't think we can offer you anything because you know you have no feeling or whatever she said and i said thank you doctor whatever thanks for introducing yourself but you can leave that's not what i want to hear 
and the whole room like you could have heard crickets you could have this went quiet and i turned to my wife my father and said has she left yet and she goes no and i said excuse me i asked you to leave and she actually left and then i said next and then we went around the whole room hearing what i needed to hear and it's funny because that's what probably put me into my ot role now because i started taking charge then you know um i heard what i wanted to hear i was being told that i couldn't be home at christmas i was being told that you know i'd have to live in a hospital for the next few months and they just people just weren't listening to me military doctors the whole lot and we had to when i say we my wife and i had to keep fighting and i had the support of rehab consultants and occupational therapists behind me giving me insight to what was happening behind the scenes and i remember going to the military base or driving to a military base on a particular day and we got this phone call and this OTRC rehab consultant called and said, oh, is Michael there? Can we put on speaker? And she goes, oh, Michael, do you know why you're going to a Nogra hospital and that? I said, yeah, we're going to sort out me going home. And he said, no, they're going to ask you to stay with the hospital. And my wife and I was trying to get myself to live with my wife who was in an apartment. So use it as a staging process. We can prove that, you know, she can... You know, help me, she can look after me, she's willing, I'm willing, and then get back to home where my family was, where my support was. And she said, no, they want you to live with them. They want you to live in the hospital, have the nurses and that look after you. And but I said, how long? Who knows, who knows? You know, so to me, it was slowing the whole process down. Anyway, I, I was so angry and my wife said, Michael, do not get out of that car, do not wait for me. And that anyway, we pulled in the hospital and she said, Michael, everyone's out here to greet you. Do not get out of the car. There's a gutter, you're gonna fall over. Anyway, me being you know, because we've been we've been facing so many barriers already and a you know, doctor's telling me not to go home, you know, I wasn't getting correct medication, I was in pain, you know, I was still accepting and wanting my own things and people weren't listening to me. Anyway, as soon as we pulled up, of course, I opened up the door tripped over this gutter my wife Katri, you know said oh god you know and the, this doctor came up goes michael michael i've got you i've got you and i said i don't need your help and i know exactly who you are just leave me alone you know and then we went into this meeting and the lieutenant colonel of the uh, military hospital at the time introduced and said oh this is what we want and uh, we want you to stay with this we've got nurses we've got that and i said let me remind you who i am you know i've been in a hospital for the last you know month i want to go home i will be home at christmas to spend it with my children i do not need an 18 7 year old nurse wiping my ass changing my bandages when i have a wife and i am capable of doing it i want to live with my wife for a week i want to prove to you that i can do this i am going to be home and there's a lot of you know back and forth and you know um and they said we'll have to think about it and that so you know i went back to alexander's and then we got the phone call and they accepted it. And they said, fine. So I was in this hospital. Um, so I was in the hospital and then I ended up going, living with my wife in this apartment for a week. And during, whilst I was living there, she was changing the bandages. I had these other machines and that on me. Uh, whilst that was happening, you know, I had to go to doctor's appointments. She would take me to her and we were self-managing. We were doing a good job. Um, and, you know, she was doing, I should say, she was doing a great job. Um, and during that time, my sight started coming back. And, and when I said start coming back, it was black and gray and white. You know, I couldn't see color. I couldn't see far. It was very hazy. But there was some sight coming back. And I had just sent my wife and mother at the time to go and look for Braille books. And we got to accept that I'm not going to see. But when they came back in, I said to mum, I said, oh, God, I hate that dress. And it didn't click with her. <laughs> and then she turned around and went, what? And I went, yeah, I'm, you know. So that was a moment. And then um, at the end of the week, the, doc the doctors, um, the military doctors and Lieutenant Colonel came and visited us at my wife's apartment and um, turned around and said, oh, I would like to speak to you. Great to see you doing so well, you know, blah, blah, blah. Would you like to see us off out the elevator? So she walked out with them at the elevator and then she came back in was I was sitting there with my father. I think we were doing something we weren't meant to be, which is drinking a beer because you just wanted to relax. And my wife, Katri, came back in and I said, oh, I had that guy. She goes, good. And she goes, you won't believe what they said again. I went, what? And they said, we we're expecting you to fail. We didn't think this happened, but well done. Credit to you and that. And I'm just going, all you hear is constant barriers. You hear that you can't do this. You can't hear that because it's that fear-based mind or people want to be seen doing the right thing. People forget about the individual. People forget about the family. And people were thinking, you know, oh, you know, 
this massive, you know, incident, you know, we've got this soldier that needs his help. They need this, they need that, you know, he's a national you know, icon right now. We need to be seen doing the right thing. Well, take two steps back, look at it from the bottom up approach and see what the person wants. Anyway, do you hear the army say that, you know, we don't know how to cope this, no one really trying to take charge, you know, people telling you where to go, you won't be home. We proved them all wrong, you know, and we got home at Christmas, you know, and when we got home, yeah, I had to, you know, be at home and be in a hospital. And I, I guess the big thing out of that, um, you know, I think it was two months after being injured, I was back at work. You know, I was back at work for myself and that was the failure that I had to learn. I went back to work two months after my incident to show my men that I was okay. I wanted to prove for them I was good. And when I was in hospital in Brisbane, every week they would send, uh, send flowers to my wife. I'd send chocolates to my son because that was a hard moment if I could go back. You know, my son at the time, Kyron, he was seven. One of the hardest things to accept was him not wanting to be with me and but that's not the case no no he was just hurt worried because obviously he had the door knock he had the padre and all that you know he heard his dad was wounded anyway i was in hospital blind and that and i'd try to coach him over come sit with me and say i'm um, sorry country would say oh he's just standing at the door he doesn't want to come in he doesn't want to be near you and it took days for him to get close anyway eventually we got him on the bed and he wouldn't sit on the bed for very long but that that all hurts and that was part of the the, the, the treating process and it took a lot and it was good for me to get back to town sort of build on those relationships but i got back to work and part of the process was to be living at home and to be in a hospital as well anyway so i was my wife went back to work and she was having her own problems with townsville hospital and all that stuff because uh, of the amount of time that she was away, which the army did a great job there again as well. They supported her and they spoke on her behalf to the Townsville Hospital. So there's a lot of collaborating and, and people trying to be understanding and there was the right support coming in the, at some places as well. But anyway, the significant point of me being in the Townsville Military Hospital is that I met this OT, her name was Fiona, and she came in, she came into my room and she, I didn't know she was there because I couldn't see too well. Um, and she was watching me apparently. And she goes, oh, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to write. I'm learning to write again. I need to write. I need to be able to articulate and all that. And she goes, oh, okay, you seem to be doing good and that. I said, I can't see it, but it's a matter of gripping the pen and trying to learn to write. Anyway, we, we just started building and she was just this other person I thought that was going to cause me trouble and give me barriers i don't need you to tell me i can't be at work i can't i don't want to hear this i know what i want to do i'm being seen at work on the i'm at a hospital right now but i'll be at work anyway the thing that she said she was leaving she says anything that i can do for you and i just brushed her off and i said no but as she walked out the door i called her back said fiona i actually do have something for you I said, I would like a workstation put in this room with a computer, with a desk, with a chair, so I can learn to write how to use a keyboard and that. She goes, I don't think we can do that. And I went, not what I want to hear. I've asked you to go and get me this. So if you can do it, that'd be great. Expecting her to fail. Anyway, I was off in the workplace doing PT, doing push-ups in a sand bucket and all this other stuff. I don't want you to brush it aside because there's a few things I do want to revisit that you've just brushed aside because... I think it's important, no, this it's fine. running around with the bucket. Tell us what had happened there. Um, so like I said, you know, I went back to work at two months. I still had my troops over in Afghanistan and I wanted to prove to them that I was still able. I wanted to show them that I was good because I had a very strong bond with, you know, my 30 men, you know, and there was a lot of guilt that I had that I had put on them. I had my best friend on the radio, you know, him having to call through the Kazavaks and, you know, all that stuff. So I had a lot of guilt and I wanted to prove to them that I was still Michael. I was still Lids. So I got back to work and one of the things was to build on my fitness because I became so weak and lost so much definition. I thought, well, I wanted to get into PT. And the people at the time, massive um, support, Rob Sanders, 
um, who was a massive support in Brisbane and he helped me achieve a lot. And the reason I say to go back to him is because he's now deceased too, unfortunately. But Rob and his wife, Gail, gave me so much support in Brisbane. And when we got back into the workplace, he was there to support me. You want to go to PT? Go, Michael. He gave me exactly what I wanted. And through that, I learned to fail. So, yep, for me to go for a run, I couldn't see or could barely see. And I had two soldiers on my left and right making sure that I did not trip for a soldier in front that I could hold. And he enabled it, you know. So you ask about the bucket, you know, we'd be running, a, we'd be running up a hill or running along a track, stop, we've got to do sit-ups, push-ups. So we do the sit-ups and I'm doing the sit-ups, yep, you know, and then we get to the push-ups. The reason for the bucket is because my hand was still in a bandage and I needed to somehow equal and give myself that ability to do a push-up. So understanding the biomechanics and what I'd lost, I said, I want a sand bucket, you know, and people looked at us differently, but I was able to do push-ups. So, you know, one of the things that came back, you know, I ended up getting part of, you know, liaising with the troops overseas. I had this video conference. I said, you know, I made sure that they had word that I was out doing PT and I was doing push-ups. So one of the things was is um, when you get back is you need to be able to beat my number of push-ups because I was pretty much seen as a hard-ass sergeant that would send people up with hills with rocks and all this stuff. So when you come back to Afghanistan, you better be doing 50 push-ups because if I can do it with one hand, you can. And they went, what? You can do 50 push-ups with one hand? I didn't tell them how I was doing it because I had still had to learn how to do one-handed push-ups, but I was still at medical appointments, had my arms and bandages. So the sand bucket was to help me to build strength in my upper body and able to do it. So everything that I did came from my initiative with the support of Rob and all the soldiers around me to enable me to build strength and to build my own identity again. So that's where the sand bucket came into it. How inspirational were you to them at that stage? I think because there was so much uh, guilt from me um, and they... I, I'm not sure how they felt. I, I, I think they felt a lot of sorrow in that as well because that's why the flowers and chocolates were sent. But I, I think from what I heard in the video conference we once had, they were inspired and they were grateful that I was alive. Because we had, a, you know, before we went to Afghanistan, we were at Malaysia, we had all these other things that we were doing. So we had a strong ball. Um, so the people, I believe, overseas, I think they were grateful to hear that I was doing well and that. But the people that were around me at the time, I think we're inspired, you know, wow, he's getting out and doing this. But I was also reliant on them because I want to take pressure off my wife who was trying to work, still help me manage, work on my son. And I'd get a duty driver to t pick me up, you know, at this time because I couldn't see. Pick me up from home, take me to work. So the soldiers were very supportive and wanted to know what was happening overseas, what happened. They wanted to know and they wanted to let me know their story. So it helped me as well. Although the soldiers were inspired and that, there was also the opposite. And I remember this one particular day getting picked up from home, taken into work, and the duty driver said, why are you doing this? I said, what? And he goes, why are you working? You don't need to, you're compensated. You can just live a normal life. You can just don't come to work. And I said, that's got no meaning to me, mate. It means nothing. I said, I'd rather be seen at work, be there for my you know, mates, for my team. But compensation, fuck DVA, like it means nothing. And, and that angered me because that was his perception, you know. The other thing is when I recall as well, you know, like I said, you know, the media, the society didn't understand Afghanistan too much at that time as well, back in 2007. And a lot of the negative feedback that was still happening in Townsville was hearing doctors in the Townsville Hospital saying, oh, you copped what you deserve, blah, blah, blah. There's, there's a lot of negativity in the culture, uh, in the society. That There's so much, and, you know, and that's what I was saying to you. Yeah, I need to write a book and all this stuff, but so much has happened, you know, and you forget it, and it all comes back to you when you start. Like, I don't go out talking about this stuff, but, um, you know, when you hear all the negative things, it, it, it does add and drives me to, you know, to the successes I've had. And... Um, you know, like I was saying, you know, Rob really helped me to achieve and prove myself. You know, he, la he allowed me to get back to work. Um, the commanding officer who was overseas at the time would come back and he saw me. And when he came back and got back to Australia because he was leading forces over there, he helped me. And I remember the conversations Dave Wainwright had. I said, I'm up here in ops, but I want to 
go back to the troop. I want to be down in the troop. I want to be the troop sergeant and again. He goes, I don't think you can. You can't see. You can't read out the names. You can't do it. I said, but let me do it. And he goes, okay, all right. So he let me go back down to the troops from the role that I was doing, which was an ops role with support. So I went back down to the troop and I tried being the troop sergeant. I must have been down there for two weeks, three weeks. So my job was, you know, to organize administration, do roll calls and that. And it was very hard with no sight, with the limited sight I was had. Was it coming back? It was coming back. It, the site was coming back and I was going, getting grafts and I, was, I had medical appointments. So during this time when I was getting back to the troops, you had to remember, yep, I was still getting picked up to and from work. I still had medical appointments. I still wanted to be with my men. I wanted to be seen. I wanted to be down there. So I went back down to the troop and I was doing what I thought I could do. But then after two or three weeks, I had to go back to Dave and go, I can't do it. So he let me fail but I also had to accept my failure to succeed. So I said to him, I can't do this, can I go back to ops? And I had to accept that loss, part of my journey, part of my recovery and everything. You know? And that was very hard. So I had to go back to ops. Um, and in the process, I kept doing my job, my sight slowly returned and then, you know, it was just the small things. I still kept facing barriers, you know. Um, Dave, at the time, my sight had returned significantly where I didn't want the duty drivers, duty driver to pick me up anymore. I decided to cycle to work. Uh, one eye, my sight wasn't the best. I got myself to work. I got myself home. Anyway, um, Dave found out that I was cycling and he stopped it. He goes, you can't do it. It's unsafe. It hasn't been approved. I don't, I don't care. This is what's happening. <laughs> and because he knew of the pain and all the barriers I had faced, he said to me, if you keep, because, you know, I could have been charged. Yep, I'm going to charge you. You're going against a lawful order, lawful command. Um, he didn't. And he just said, if you don't stop, I'm going to take money. You will not get paid. And that hurt <laughs> because that will impact my family more. Sure. So I end up reading this Fiona uh, OET and said, you can't believe what just happened. This is what's happened. I want an assessment. You need to come out and assess me. And she goes, what? I said, okay. So a week later, her and this lady, Sarah, came out and they assessed me riding a bike and they deemed me competent, if you want to put it as such. And that gave me the confidence to go, well, screw you. I'm riding to and from. And that's where things really you know, started kicking off from that moment because I was able to cycle a bike. I was able to prove things wrong. And, you know, and then I decided to get back into swimming and, you know, that created barriers. You know, I was always a good swimmer. I still had my PTSD, depression and that. And it was hard to be accepted in society from my perception. You know, hearing negative comments from doctors and soldiers and not being able to succeed or to be who I was, I had to take a step to get to the pool. And I had to work out, I'll have to do a taxi because work's not going to pay for it. I can't do it. And it was late and... I took this massive step, all right, I'll go to the pool, I'll get a taxi to do it. My wife said, we don't need to be doing this, but I need to find who I am. And, you know, you, you can imagine, you know, after, you know, 15 years of growing up fully abled and being able to do it, I lost my identity. I was a blue collar, you know, I was physically able and I'd lost everything and I wanted to go back to the pool. And I got to the pool and, you know, so much anxiety, so much hurt and so much questioning was going on. And, you know, I built on swimming. And the reason it's important is because once again, it was that barrier I had to overcome this time because it was my thoughts and feelings and, you know, being accepted. But I thought I was doing something great. And then the taxi driver, you know, goes, oh, one day, because, you know, I usually hook up with the same one. We build up a rapport. Then I got this new one. And he goes, oh, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm going to the swimming. I'm getting better. I'm going to swim you know, Maggie to Townsville. He goes, what? Won't you swim in a circle? Or swim in circles? I said, what? I said, no, mate. No, I'm just as able as everyone else. Like, and it just drove me further. So I kept swimming and then I ended up doing a crossing from, you know, Maggie to Townsville. And when I was successful in that, it wasn't enough. And then I had to go out and do the rock nest swim, you know? So it put more hours and stress on the family and me. But I... It put stress on the family, but I was trying to find out who I was, you know, and the impacts on children and family was massive, you know, there's so many circumstances my wife and I had split and I, I just remember, 
you know, it's just the small things. And one of the small things was, you know, me not being able to wash dishes properly. You know, my wife wanted me to put them in the dishwasher or she would do them, but I wanted to take the pressure off her. I don't want her to do them. So I wanted to wash the dishes. We'll stick them in a dishwasher. No, I don't want to stick them. I want to be able to feel the sensation of warm water and being able to do it properly. You know, so I was pig headed. She wanted the dishes done properly. I wanted to feel, I wanted to do it. So there's those stresses, there was media, there's work and that. And, you know, you know, we're talking about caregiver strain. You know, I lost my identity. I was trying to rebuild who I was. She remembered who I was. You know, conflict of interest, I guess you could say, with media and, 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 and society. So we grew apart, you know. And, you know, university, I wanted to go to uni. She didn't want me to go to uni, you know. Why not? Well, once again, you know, people have this perception, you know, life is about taking what's given to you, compensation. You've been compensated for this, you know. I agree with her, you know, it would have been a more comfortable life sitting at home, looking after raising the kids, but would I have been happy? I don't know. And that was the question I couldn't answer for myself. You know, is this who I'm going to be for the rest of my life? Sitting at home, raising kids, kids not realizing what who dad can be. And, um, you know, she didn't say, she no, you can't go to university. But like, again, like I said, you know, when you look at the dynamics of things, you know, me trying to do the dishes, me wanting to do more for the kids, me wanting to go, it put a strain on her too. And we probably could have communicated better. We could have done it. And, you know, me attending medical appointments, we just broke down, you know. Um, and I would never, ever take anything away from her for what she gave me, for what she has given me. Um because she did a marvelous job and unfortunately our relationship is very hostile now you know like we can talk but it's very <laughs> black and white you know we've got two kids you know um but you know it, it just grew apart because i had to find out who i was again have you i i have you know like i am michael lydia i am a soldier but i'm also an occupational therapist and the confliction there is is who i was and who i am you know I hear even yesterday when I was working, you know, you know, you don't have PTSD or you don't have the level of PTSD that I have. People have no idea how I wake up. People have no idea what, how I sleep. People have no idea the hardship I put myself through to get at work, you know. But I know the importance of it. And you know, I was talking to my son, you know, we had a two and a half or two hour drive up here and we had a great chat up here and I said, it's exhausting. You know, it is exhausting. You know, three fingers, one eye, trying to build on a, a relationship, you know, with your, your daughter and, you know, trying to build on relationships and work and trying to deal with society or social pressures. It gets tiring, you know. But it's also rewarding knowing that I can do it like a normal person, you know. My ex-partner, for whatever reasons, and I'm not going to disclose them that why we end up going our way, um... You know, we went to my daughter's school, you know, um, to enroll her. Anyway, um, because of the reasons we end up going our way, um, I bent down to pick up some papers and that, and I realised I needed to do something on my phone. So I checked the phone and she said, oh, would you like me to pick up the papers? I said, no, it's right, I've got it. And she goes, Michael B. Michael. And I said, fuck you. Um, and it's not because... I didn't appreciate her reaching out. It was because of our history and what I felt or feel that she had done wrong to me and me maintaining barriers, you know? So I'm always trying to worry and build on relationships that I have and want to be seen normal and want to do all that stuff. But for anyone, well, we're all normal. Life is tough. And when you're a single mum, a single dad, you know, and you're building the relationships with your children and making sure they've got the better education, and then you put on your lower back pain or you put on, you know, a loss of function or you can't get up in the morning to take them to the sport, well, that's tough on that individual. But you look at it at the same time with me where I can't see too clearly these days and I've got to magnify things, anything, it's a lot tougher. I've got to adapt to everything. And one of the most exhausting things with my life is, you know, pre-positioning or pre-preparing for everything. So I try to think ahead. To come up here, I needed to make sure that, you know, everyone does it, but I have to go that extra go. Like, you know, it's becoming more natural, you know, make sure the clothes fit you properly, blah, blah, blah. You know, I've got enough clothes and, and so forth. But because I've got three fingers, I've got minimal sight. I just need to make sure for safety, security, for my son, blah, 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 everything's done and dusted. Let's go back to Fiona, that workstation. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
What happened with the workstation? You've asked her, she's taken off, said it can't be done. Mm. What happened? She goes, I don't know if it can be done, but I'll, be tr- I'll try. I think that's what her words were. I went, yeah, okay, good on you. And, and just brushed it off, right? Because I've, I've had enough um, <laughs> yeah, barriers. Anyway, I went to work, did whatever I was doing. And I don't know, it could have been a week later, you know. So I was going in at a house still, not seeing any change, not seeing that workstation, not seeing anything. I went to work one particular day, doing my job in ops or doing PT, came back to my room and there's a workstation with a computer and a pen and paper. Nice. She proved herself to me, which was enough to build on a relationship. And that's what I mean. From there, she stayed with me. I kept choosing her. Um, One of the other things that kept happening was um, I had a doctor that in the military that I came very close to. um, And he kept helping me and he and I built a rapport on that, but then he had to move on. And then I got this other doctor military doctor and he was Russian or German or something. I couldn't even understand. He said, I don't need this. I don't need to explain my story to you. I'm tired of this. I just want to be normal. Had to put this massive request in, went to Fiona. We want, I want this. And it wasn't being seen as needy. It was wanting to be treated, not having to explain my situation over again. And anyway, I ended up getting back to this doctor, which aided me in my recovery because being given another doctor although my medical file was there or we need to go everything set me back so fiona kept helping me through my recovery you know not just with the workplace station working on you know maintaining doctors i also wanted to get back to ead work and that's very critical because i just told you that i just failed at my troop sergeant role and i said well my site's gotten back but better i'm now riding to and from i can be an ead tech so what's an EAD? So I was bomb disposal. Yeah. yeah. So I get was, back to it. Yeah, explosive ordnance disposal. So I wanted to get back to disposing and managing a team. I might not have been able to do the same level, but there's got to be some aspect of it. And the EAD failure rate is huge. So, you know, you might have 12 soldiers going through it and might only have three people pass. So it's a very intense course. Not everyone can pass it. Anyway, she goes, oh, look, you can't do it. Think of safety. So you've got to let me try. Anyway, the EAD guys that were there, all right, let's give this a crack. And once again, it was a lesson of failure where I had to accept and learn. So they set up an EAD task. Was it the right one for me? Probably not. But was it one that was practical? It was. And the reason I say it wasn't the right one for me because I had to learn my failures and it was something really simple. We had land ordnance, mortars, and some um, um, projectiles just laying on the surface. And I couldn't see them because they were green and because they were laying at the grass, I got too close or because of this, I couldn't read the text. I learned that I couldn't go back to EOD and I had to accept that. I could wear the badge or whatever, but I had to learn. So Fiona helped me through my successes, but she also helped me through my failures. She helped me through my failures to realize, well, you can't do this, but there's more opportunity for you elsewhere, you know? So, you know, she helped me with the desk. She helped me with doctors. She helped me with understanding that I needed another role. You know, I moved from 3CR into what they call a combat and training center role where I facilitated all the uh, mission rehearsals for bomb disposal. So I was still playing with explosives and I was doing this. I had a team around to support me. So I was still well and truly employed, um, which was fantastic. You know, she helped me get back to, you know, doing what I loved. You know, it wasn't EAD, but I had the qualifications to do the particular job where I was good. And then... Um, I guess what really hit the punch next was, you know, I was going through courses and I ended up going and doing a search advisor course. And I was down there for two weeks doing a search advisor course. And, you know, I failed a component, which was a critical component because I couldn't, you know, do map to ground. I couldn't read a map. I couldn't do something. Anyway, when the course had finished, I had failed. And everyone said well we haven't passed with or failed too because you haven't given michael the opportunity he can do this you just need to give him time or change the tmp to let him do it so i think we had to stand on a hill and pick points and and say these are things but i couldn't do that i had to go to a map and because that wasn't in the tmp or learning module you can't refer to a map well you failed you know so the army wasn't up to scratch then so i failed that course and then they said come back for a retest we've changed tmp yep i passed that course so I passed that course. I ended up doing a couple other courses and in my, to become a warrant officer. So I was a sergeant at the time. Anyway, I got to this one particular course, done all my sub twos and fours for sergeant co- uh, warrant officer. So I passed all those warrant officer courses and then got to this one particular course, warrant officer class one. 
started doing all the pre-learning modules, passed that, yep, you've been acknowledged, yep, you can go on the course. And I've got a joining instruction sent to me, yep, you're due down here. And so the course was meant to start on the Monday. The unit CTC, which I was with and organizing mission rehearsal exercises with, was deploying on the Monday. I had set everything up for them to go ahead with that exercise whilst I was away on this warrant officer course. And on the Friday, because I was going to drive down on the Saturday, on the Friday, I got called into my CEO's office. So RSM knocked on the door, goes, Michael, the CEO, and I'd like to talk to you. Okay, no problems. So I walked in, have a seat, I had a seat, and yeah, how's things going? I said, yeah, everything's good. You know, all the pre-commission's done, um, user set. You know, everyone knows what they're doing for your stick lanes and all that stuff. And I'm just driving down uh, on Saturday and goes, about that, I want to read this email out to you. And I sat there and he read, there's no requirement for Sergeant Michael Lydiard to attend the uh, sub one warrant officer course or to be promoted to warrant officer. And I fucking lost my shit. And the RSM just goes, Michael, this isn't us. This has come from the top. You know, you can't do the course. And I lost it. I, I was so angry, you know, they just stopped my career progression there and then. And all my performance reviews had been top notch you know performing doing this i was i was doing everything that was asked i was even going through tully and crawling through the jungle and all that stuff you know i was trying to work out ways how to modify the warrants of course to hold a sword you know instead of being in the right hand it'd be in the left hand how do i do this you know and these were barriers i had to face but because this email they just stopped my career progression so they turned around and they said you can have the day in that off and that you know you don't have to go down next week, just come to the office. I said, no, I'm going bush with you next week. I will go bush with you next week. I, I just stormed out of the office, got my stuff, you know, all sorted, tell my wife what was going on at the time and went bush on Monday. And I had a purpose while I was going to bush on Monday because I wanted to backdoor the system. I wanted to tell everyone what was going on. And I had a lot of support. This is wrong. You should be doing it. And I had wing commanders saying that we're happy to articulate for you or advocate for you. We want to support you. You should be doing this course. You can do this course. But for whatever reason, the TMP or whatever nonsense they did, they said I couldn't do that course or promote it. So it's a big conscience thing, you know, in, in your, losing your identity because they stopped you from doing a course. They stopped you from being someone that you could have been. And financially, they impacted on my family. You know, you get promoted a warrant officer, more responsibility, more pride, you know, more ownership. But there's also a bit of a pay level that can help my family to have a quality of life that we all hope to have at the time. So understanding, you know, so this impacted on my relationship with the country as well, because, you know, obviously there was so much going on. Anyway, I was telling everyone and when I came back from that exercise, which obviously ran really smoothly, um, there was no incidents or anything. I lost it. I had to take a week off and I had a relapse and got admitted to hospital and um, actually, I'm not quite sure it was then, no, actually it could have been another time, I, I think actually, no, sorry. So that was what's happening in the background, you know, I went back to work and we did whatever and whatever. And then I think a few months later, it was a few months later, I got another email saying, Michael, you've been medically discharged. I just went, well, I just, I just, what the hell? And then once again, the CA just said, take some time off. And I was furious because, you know, I had just finished the Rock Nest Channel swim, came back, been told, you're not doing the warrant officer course, you're not being promoted. I'd been performing two, three months later, Michael, you've been medically separated. And I lost it. I said, you're just kicking me out. You're just, no, we're not doing that. We're not doing that at all. I said, you just gave him my resignation and told me that's it. You're still welcome to you, Michael. I said, no, I'm not. I know how the military works. You're telling me I'm Mech 3. You're gone. You're closing the gate. Fuck you. And you, go, you need to take the time off. I said, you're damn right I do. Anyway, I went into a massive relapse. I uh, hit the alcohol, hit the smokes, um, you know, got hospitalized and all that stuff. Um, at the same time, I snapped out of it two, three days later. And I said, screw you. you you've just put another thorn in you know, my backside. Called up the cave, called up DVA, said, what can you give me? What can you, you know? And then I wrote a report and I went back to work, you know, a week or a fortnight later with this report in my hand. I said, and they said, oh, what have you decided? I said, this is what I've decided. I'm going to go to university. And if you don't accept it, I'm going to go to the media. 
I said, oh, we don't know if you can offer this. I said, it's not a discussion. I said, I've got a letter here from the chief of army at the time saying, I'll always have a job in the military. You have stopped my career. You have done this. And I, you know, the CEO and the RSM really, really understanding. And they really had to, they had to probably cop a lot from me um, because seriously wounded soldier, this could go so wrong. The CEO rewrote the report, got a, I don't know, whatever he did to it. <laughs> anyway, um, and they changed the whole mech system. Okay, Michael, you can go to uni. But, you know, and they, they followed what I wanted, but someone else got the appraisal for it. Someone else got the recognition for it. And I'm the injured soldier that got the, you know, no career advancement. You can't do this course. You're being kicked out. I came up with this plan, you know, to go to university. The CEO rewrote the thing. Oh, we need to change the MEC system. Well, it was me that instigated this, but you get the accommodation for it because whatever, you know. I'm not, not sure 100% it came that way, but um, anyway, it went to what I wrote. Yep, I'll prove you I went wrong. So the whole MEC system had changed because of myself and a guy called Liam Haven. And I know that because I then had another colonel come up to me and go, because of you and Liam, you know, the MEC system had changed. You're the first one to do this, Michael, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, oh, I know, because I wrote the frigging report. <laughs> you know, anyway, so I proved him wrong and it went how I wanted it. So, you know, I was fortunate enough where I was in the military providing a service to a capacity whilst doing, you know, what I called a bridging course. As soon as I passed that bridging course, yep, it was all good. I still maintained my role in the army, I think for another three years whilst I was at uni. And then the final year of uni, I said, not nah, DVA will pick it up. And that's what DVA did for me. In a nutshell, that's what pretty much happened. And, and that's what I mean. I can sit here and we can go back and forth, but there's been so much. And I guess that's what's created me and built me to who I am. So if we went back to the question, do I know who I am? I am very determined, you know, and I love life. I love living life. I've got to find my life again in Brisbane um, because it's a different cultural shock, community shock coming from towns that are Brisbane and understanding, you know, obviously how to fit in. You left a majority of your friends, good friends up in Townsville and then trying to come to a community that has little understanding. Well, it's not a garrison city. And building on networks with a partner, with a daughter, you know, it's very cordial, very friendly like. And they have your son down here and, and just trying to build on things, you know. Would you have made a good way one? Oh, I believe so, 100%. You know, I was very well respected. I was well, very well known. I might have been hard, but I was very loyal and very fair, you know. If a soldier didn't want to run up a hill with a rock, he didn't have to because then he would be doing it with me and I'd be running up the hill with the rock and him carrying a rock. But instead of doing it once, we're now doing it five times. So I think that's fair. You made me run the hill, well, we're gonna do it five times. So I was fit and I was fair, you know, and I was, you know, I cared about my men. I cared about, you know, the administration and their families. So yeah, I, I would have made a good way, but I never got the opportunity. So is that something I've had to accept and annoyed with? Yeah, I've accepted it, but it still frustrates me, yeah. I wanna go back to the, um, the injury when it all happened. You were talking about when you were medevaced out. There's what they call the golden hour. You were outside that golden hour and you thought you were going to die. Everyone else did. Talk us through what went through your mind at that stage. You were thinking you were going to die. What happened? Well, like I said, I was blown back. So blown back and not understanding the concept of what happened, you know. Um, I heard Warren. I spoke out to Warren. And Warren came to my aid, he cleared his way in and he held and looked after me and so forth. And like I said, I just said to him, mate, this is what happened. This is what I did. I prodded, exploded, et cetera, et cetera. He goes, I saw it, I saw it, it's all good. And, you know, although I could hear what he was saying, I kept telling him because subconsciously or consciously I knew I couldn't live because by the time it had, he got to me and he, I said, man, what's wrong? He goes, mate, you've lost your, you've lost your hand, you've lost this, your head split. He told me, he was, oh, this thing. I said, and you know, he was very open in that. And we had a great report and we, we speak very often. And, you know, maybe, I, I don't know, maybe after 10 minutes, the pain had started setting in. And that's when, you know, I said, look, I need to talk through my foot and that. And because I was losing consciousness and, and, and so forth, I'd always go back, mate, this is what's happening. And my mate, Warren, would say, you've told me this. And he'd try to change the topic. So he'd always co continue to change it. And then, like I said, we got to 48 minutes. And the thing is, is my three and, my three and number four, 
Um, we didn't have a first aid kit. The first aid kit we had didn't have the morphine because they gave it to the infantry. And at that 48 minutes, that's when the CEO and the doctor had walked in and gave me the morphine. And my understanding is they had to wave off a chopper for whatever reason. I had this morphine and God, you can, I, I can remember the sensation of the morphine and that, and that's really when you feel calm and, you know, like you, you really do remember it. Oh God, it's cold, you know, but it, it was fantastic. And it released a lot of pain because, you know, I, Mason asked me, well, can you remember much of it? I said, it was painful. You know, I, I could still taste the, you know, the blood, the dirt. I still have the smell. Um, people ask you, what, what is it? There's no experience and we might get back into what my thoughts are about hell and God. But, you know, there is no expression of what I felt on that day except supported by Warren and my team. You know, um, and then after the getting the morphine, yeah, I blacked out a bit, and then I remember getting put onto that door, and then taken into, put on the chopper. And it's important to note that because I remember coming to the downwind and all that, and seeing the guys and saying "seeing you later," because when I got, when I became an OT, and I ended up working for Five Aviation, I went through a relapse. Being, I became agitated. I was sweating. I couldn't concentrate and I didn't know why and, and, and it didn't resonate with me why I couldn't work it out and I ended up calling my manager at the time which was Fiona because I ended up working for the same company that rehabilitated me and I said I can't work I, I don't know what's wrong I went home now I'm getting emotional again but after a day or two I worked it out it was because it was a chopper it was the downwind it was the jet fuel when I was at work, there was choppers rotating, there was a jet fuel smelling, and it brought everything back. It literally brought everything back. And um, Fiona goes, look, take time off. And I went, no, I can't do that. I now know what triggered me. I need to get back. I need to go back. And she goes, well, work from the office. I said, no, I can't hide. I can't do that. Let me do it my way. She goes, well, how are you going to do it? And, and we came up with compromise. I'll go in there in the morning and we'll build on that tolerance. It was hard for a mu- you know, month, two months, I was anxious, I was sweaty. You know, these are the barriers I had to face. You know, you were talking about labels. You know, I didn't want to have that label of PTSD on me. I didn't want to live up to that label. For my own self-recognition and for my own self-worth to prove to my children, to prove I was self-worth, I needed to come over it, you know? So I gradually built on being in fiveation. Does it still bother me? Well, it does because I still get emotional about it and it, it does bother me, but I have a better idea what my triggers are. I have a better understanding of how to handle it. So that, you know, we're talking about, you know, labels and accepting barriers and failing and all that. It's how much you're willing to push yourself. So yeah, probably have high blood pressure and things like that because I keep trying to push myself. But going back to what you were talking about, put onto the, the chopper at an hour four or whatever and then landed in TK you know, I was blacked out and I was definitely heavily medicated by then. And I remember coming to and once again telling everyone this is what happened. And I remember being in a, a you know, C-130 or Galaxy or whatever it was and I had my best friend there. And I came to at that time and I said, oh, Chris, you're here because the CIA allowed my best mate who was on the radio that called in all the support to be with me. And I said, Chris, this is what happened. You know, Bama goes, mate, you've told us this 20,000 times. It's all good. Just relax because... I didn't understand where I was at that time. After the morphine had hit, after I'd hit, you know, hit the ground in TK, after I had Brian looking after me for 48, who never left my side, um, which is phenomenal again. Um, you know, I just kept telling the story because by that time, you know, I thought I was dead or I didn't understand what was going on. So by the time we landed in Germany, I was, you know, I landed in Germany. The M, um, the army allowed my mother and parents to come to Germany as well. And when they came to Germany, I was still hallucinating and, and, and saying, this is what happened. But I got to a point where they must have been taking off the medication off me. And I was having these nightmares and my mum was thinking I was brain dead and, you know, because and, all this stuff, and this is where hell and heaven come into play. But, you know, I, I was having all these these memories and all these flashbacks, everything was happening at once. Anyway, my mum... I was thinking I was brain dead. Anyway, when I came to and I was blind, I was more a coherent. And I had my wife, Katri, there, obviously, emotional and upset. 
you know, she's upset. And I said, hey, how you going? You know, and I was pretty well good to it. I said, and she, I said, come in close. I said something to her and she goes, oh, hey, she said something to me. I said, I said to her, I said, oh, I don't know if it's working. You know, I don't know if it's working. She goes, what are you talking about? What's working? I said, can you suck my cock? I don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> and she goes, Michael, there's doctor standing around. You can't say that type of thing. You know, I tried making light out of something because I sensed her hurt and that. And it's one of the things that I could be proud of. You know, it was probably not at the right moment to say that, but I was trying to make her happy and I was more aware of I was in that. And then when I was there, you know, obviously, you know, they started kept wearing off the medication. I kept understanding more and more about my injuries. You know, I then started understanding the losses. You know, I couldn't see. I was trying to feel my arms with, or bandaged. I couldn't feel with my left hand. You know, that was fully bandaged. Um, and that's when all the dreams and pain really started coming in because the medication was obviously wearing off, but it was the realization of what had happened. And that's when the, the traumatic feelings and thoughts hit because, you know, I was grateful that my family was there. I was missing my boys. I realized what I had lost. I realized what I had done. And then, and that's what I mean, you know, and then getting put onto the... Qantas jet, I remember being in there and being in so much pain again, you know, and I was embarrassed for it because they blacked out half the aircraft and that for me. Or, you know, they closed this off, you know, they, they had, we had, we had passengers in that, in the front end of the aircraft. I had my doctors in that. And I remember I was in so much pain. I had a doctor with me, I had my wife with me and I just felt guilty for the pain. And they were trying to settle me down and all that, but it was just painful, you know. Anyway. I didn't understand where I was either, but I just felt guilty for the pain and blah, blah, blah. And my wife then told me, oh, this, you know, you're in a plane. This is what's happening. This is what... She would talk me through it. So would the doctor. And like I said, when I when I landed in Australia on the 11th, 11th, the corners pulled up and the, the pilot turned around and said, you know, I would just like to acknowledge in the back, you know, me, the family, and the and the plane and the plane, you know, came to a roar and clapped and did all that stuff and you know, yeah, good. It made me tearful, it made me joyful, it made me sad, it made me depressed, it made me everything. And that's when I said, you know, oh look, I want to meet the staff and thank them and do all that. So I met the pilot and was grateful. I think I think I got a got a photo i've just lost all the photos but i've got a photo and that with him and i just remember that moment i remember coming down the stairs and i swear i kissed the ground because there's no such feeling being back home you know you know you've been back at home and been realizing that you're safe realizing that nothing can happen you're not there's nothing to be harmful to realize that you're with people that love you. Yeah, it was overpowering. So. I guess one of the, the things I want to say is everything that I'm sharing with you is hard. It doesn't come lightly, but I'm sharing it because I don't ever talk about myself, my relationships, my children can tell you that. I don't believe in talking about my military service. One, you know, a bit of shame. Two, I don't really consider myself as a veteran anymore but also share it maybe to help others people to understand that you know our diagnosis are diagnosis but they don't define who we are i don't talk about myself because yeah there's probably some shame and there's some guilt how could there be guilt with the absolute courage that you've displayed both post-injury and during injury and in your service when i was a really young kid to be honest i thought i'd die in war i honestly thought i'd die in war and it's it's funny because i think of you know the movie saving private ryan you know the lieutenant you know oh, i always wanted to die in war and that and that resonates with me because i honestly did think that's the way i'd go how old were you when that happened when I had that thought, oh, yeah. maybe 15. Oh, it was just something I'd accept. Oh, yeah, I will die. Let it be, you know, and, and that's what it was. You know, guilt in the fact that I, I let 
things get the better of me. I let the enemy get the better of me. The guilt and the fact that I cause so much harm to others. I caused a lot of heartache to my friends, my mates, my commanders. I put more stress on my relationships. I've caused heartache to my children. I've caused stress to my children. So there is guilt and there's shame in the fact that I am judged because of the way I'm looked at. There's shame because, you know, regardless, oh, we treat people equally. We treat people, we don't. You know, we can talk about individuals, but an individual can be a community too. You know, like my examples I gave before. So there's, I put that shame and guilt to one side, but every time I look up in the morning and go to the mirror, I'm reminded. You know, I, I speak about my past relationships and comments that she may have made or comments that have been made by my wife. Comments have been made by soldiers or... The army held you back. Do you think they blame you for getting injured and in some ways putting them into disrepute because of the adverse publicity that it brought the army? No, no not at all. I, I don't think that. You know what? The, the army, you could say, have done some things wrong by me. I feel that the wrong, they have done wrong by me. But at the same time, the army has made a lot of changes to do the better. And I can say that, you know, from where I was in the army serving and from where I am as an OT, the changes have been good, have been great. Great for the soldier, great for the family. So, you know, from hardship, people do change. You know, organisations change. And that's where we get growth. So, you know what, you do hear, well, the army doesn't support the soldiers. But when you look back and you compare even from the stories I heard from the old man being in Vietnam and that to where I served and to where I am now, the changes have been magnificent or significant to help those. Even with DVA, you know, you hear about DVA. You know, I have my own problems with DVA, but at the same time, their changes have been significant to support families, to support people. Are you always going to please people? No, because... They're the majority and you can't please the majority because we're all individuals. But you can tr try to do right and that's what they have done by changing. What's the biggest thing out of talking today that you really want to put across? I don't think there's one thing. There's just so much in my lifespan and so many life changes that happen that I think so many people, different people can get different aspects of it. But if I guess I had to pick one thing it would be the collaboration or the combination of not letting your conditions or your diagnosis label you not letting community or individuals define you not let compens uh, compensation streams tell you how to live your life I sit here emotional and open, but at the same time, I am doing that because by me pushing myself and trying to feel what's normal shouldn't stop me from being me. And, you know, labeled with PTSD, uh, depression, and having my physical challenges can easily keep me at home. And if DVA, or the military or anyone ever questions me saying that you don't have PTSD or your PTSD isn't severe, they don't live my life. They just don't understand but how hard I'm willing to live life or how well I want to be seen living life. And one of the things that I learned ages ago and one of the things that I try to incite in my clients is what legacy do you want to leave behind? And that gets people thinking, what's your legacy? And the thing that I've learned is I can easily be defined by my labels or my you know, diagnosis. I can be easily defined by society, easily defined by individuals. But by me defining what PTSD is to me and defining what depression is and defining what my facial scars are all about is by me living life and showing my children and my friends 
and my family that I'm not letting it define me. I'm getting out and living the life that I need to. And just because I work or I am seen to society doesn't mean I'm not at stress. It means I'm accepting the stress. I'm managing the stress to live a life that I want and for my children to see me and be proud of me. You've used a lot of the motivation that you've developed and you've channeled it into sport. What was the motivation there? Once again, it comes down to that community, individual, the organisation, the compensation systems telling me what I can, can't do and defining me. You know, I got into sport because I wanted to be able to feel, you know, yes, I've lost my limbs and my face is scarred, but I don't have that fine touch anymore. I don't feel hot water like others feel. I don't smell taste like others. By getting into sport psychologically, it challenged me. It challenged me to accept the way people looked at me. It challenged me psychologically by accepting who I was, accepting the way people looked at me and trying to overcome my feelings and my thoughts of anxiety and sadness and guilt and grief. Physically, sport helped me by doing. One of the things I remember doing, you know, is when I was swimming and, you know, feeling the water on my arms or feeling it on the back and feeling at peace, you know, was getting out of the water and running to a line and hearing a lady saying, holy shit, he can swim. Because I wasn't last, I wasn't first, I might have been fifth or sixth, but I'm no different to anyone else. If I give it, I give it all. So sport has given me physical, psychological and emotional resilience and the fact that I've had to build on me. And I don't talk about my past, like I said, because I don't, it brings up too much baggage. But the sport enables me to realize and give me the, to, enables me to feel what I've lost. So I get satisfaction from it. You get to feel though, and that's a really interesting thing that people that haven't gone through the sort of trauma that you have, you're talking about feeling certain things. Most people just take it for granted. Yeah, and, and, and that's when it comes down to that fear-based mind, a positive mindset, you know, neurohacks. Like I said, you know, in Townsville, you know, I, I had a lot of support. You know, I had coaches or people I could go cycling with. But it wasn't just about that support. It was being able to feel what they could feel and enjoying it. Coming down to Brisbane, though, you've uh, it's been difficult. What's happened? Why is it so difficult down here in Brisbane to set up those networks and establish something similar to what you had already uh, together in Townsville? I, I try to identify why. I, I can say Townsville is a garrison city, but in Townsville, I had Fiona, you know, the OT that supported me. I had my military mates that really knew me and saw the challenges that I had gone through. I had my swimming colleagues. I had my cycling and running buddies that knew my hardship. They knew what I couldn't see. They knew how I rode or how I needed to adapt to swimming. They knew that my sight or my arms couldn't allow me to do certain things. And they supported and coached and pushed me through that. When I got to Brisbane, the traffic is so much heavier. People seem to be more fast paced. People seem to be more arrogant. People don't seem to be so open, but it's not just them, it's me. It's, it's the fact that, you know, when you look at being down in a park with your daughter and being questioned what to say to another child or being on a, a dating site and being judged because of, oh, you've lost limbs or you look different. It reduces your self-confidence. And then you try to work out, I've come so far, but at the same time, how do I rebuild that? You know, yes, I can get out onto a bike tomorrow and cycle at what cost? I'm not at that level that I used to be at elite. 
I've got to get back out on the bike and I've got to manage the traffic with one eye, poor sight, not knowing the roads, not being confident on the roads in that traffic and in that area. For me to open up to someone and say, I need help is hard. It's, you know, you want to be independent. People want to help, but it's trying to let them in and understand and you don't want to slow them down as well. So if it was to be cycling, look, I need to learn. I can do this. I want to do this, but I'm not at that level again. And you feel like you're going to be pulling them back. You know, it's like anyone getting into a sport, but the greater challenge is, is because one, you know, I need to adapt to everything. You know, like I said, I need to pre-position things or I need to prepare for those activities in preparation, not to cause harm to myself, make sure that others are safe. It's not overanalyzing. It's just the fact that the way my life has been, I've got to adapt to it. So it's been hard to reach out to explain again and explain tell people who I am, what I am, how I need help and build those models. Would it be great to someone go, hey, we want to help you. We want to do this. And I've tried. You go to Mates for Mates and their programs are tailored for veterans. I'm a veteran, but they help me to realize I'm not because most veterans don't work. Most veterans go to their programs during the day or most veterans are out hiking you know during the week i can't because i get more satisfaction out of helping others or avoiding my own issues by working and i go to work and then when i sought help through mates for mates they couldn't help me and then when i asked oh can you put me in contact with people on my side or we can't give you that information and that's as far as it went they couldn't put me in contact with anyone and reach out i've met some people and some great people here in Brisbane, but the at my caliber and the fact where I say, you know, they want to get out and they want to enjoy life, they want to have drinks and that, and that's only one part, you know. I want to be able to still do my sporting things and I want to be able to do that with people and I haven't been able to find those people. Yes, I need to reach into a triathlon team and that again, but it's just so hard because you've got to explain your whole situation again and you need support. And we are talking about support before, but at what cost are you putting on to that support? You know, what drain, what financial, what emotional effect do they, or what cost do they have to give me to help me achieve my dream? Is that right? Is that Did right? you ever look at it though, that what they will get out of it by helping you? Well, like I said, everyone's normal. I want to be seen normal. And it's a hard thing, you know, you said, we're talking about before, you know, someone that is born blind compared to someone that's, you know, you're blind. It's part of the hardness of, the hardship of accepting it. You've got to let your walls down. You've got to try to let people in. And I let people in, but I, how to explain to people what you feel every day and that can be a drain. You know, my last partner, um, who I've got my daughter with, she's, she's fantastic. She was everyone, everything that I was, and, you know, outgoing, loved life and things. And like, I love life. I love smile. I love going out and doing things. But my stresses bring me to a comfort level where when I was with her, she brought me back up to that level and made me feel amazing and made me feel, you know, where we were. And, and, and it was fantastic. So it's hard to want to put my expectations onto someone else so to reach out to say oh, i want to do this i want to do that and accept them to say yes i'm willing to help you comes at a cost i feel it's interesting when you talk about ptsd that it is questioned in you yet you're injured and to me the injury is something that just keeps on giving in the worst possible way yeah and and that's what i mean i'd like to think that i give my self credit for my labels i don't think enough i don't think you give yourself enough credit but at the same time, it always sits in the back of my mind by me defining my conditions at what cost. Because compensation processes systems will see me as able and take away the quality of life that I fight for. Potentially, yes, I'm on a class A pension, which I've come accustomed to and have built a life around. And if they took that away from me, yes, it would impact on me. But the class A pension has been given to me because of my losses and the things that I've dealt with. But if they see me 
as able, as efficient as I am, it actually doesn't show and they don't understand the hardship and the stresses that I have in life to take that away. Just because I'm physically getting out to work, they don't understand what it takes for me to get out of work. They don't understand the pressures that I'm at work to perform at that level or that credit that you talk about as everyone else. I try to give myself credit and it's one of, the, one of my weaknesses. I don't give myself enough credit. And that's what I mean. I, I loved my last relationship and I, you know, because I felt that credit in her, if that makes sense. And um, maybe that's the hardest thing to, to be letting go of her. In your sporting arena, you excelled at the Invictus Games. How important are the Invictus Games and that sort of uh, collaboration of sporting veterans? We're going to take a, a bit further step back. So with my sporting achievements, yes, I've swam, I've swam numerous swims from Townsville to, or Magnetic to Townsville. I did a double crossing from Maggie to Townsville. I have swam the Rock Nest Channel solo. I've done the Mark Webber Challenge. I've done numerous triathlons. I've done an Ironman and a lot of adventure thons which is you know mountain bike riding paddling and all that one of the other things that i had done was attempt to get into the paralympics for swimming and triathlons and the thing that i learned through that is that i was not suited for paralympics because when they classify someone they classify them on their disabilities which is fine but because i have multiple I have sensory and physical, I'm always going to be on the end or the end of that scale. So I would not be on the top of the swimming scale against Matt Cowdery because he had the same losses as me plus one full hand, but he had sight. Mm. So he could see the edge of the pool clearer than me and he would excel in the pool better than me because he had a full hand, but I was only three seconds below him. When I came to the triathlons, yes, I could swim and I was competing up there against the other Paralympics. But when it came to cornering and when it came to, you know, running, I couldn't see or judge the corner as well as them because of my visual difficulties, but because of my hand dexterity, but where they had just lost the leg or they had one arm. So it was, I have got multiple. So go to your question with the para, oh, sorry, the Invictus. I have done two and the first one, was a challenge because we went overseas and it was the first time I had ever gone overseas with a group and I was out of home, I was out of comfort. And when I went to Canada, I struggled. I struggled being out of Australia because I wasn't in my comfort. And I had to push through it. And I remember breaking down during service, um, the opening and closing services because, you know, because of the memories, because of the flashbacks and breaking down because of the emotions that were brought in. What happened? Um, well, when I, when I got to Canada, I was so, my, my, I felt my eyesight was playing up and the emotions started getting to me, which started impacting my injuries. They had to take me to the doctors. And I think it was more probably psychological that impacted. And then everything got cleared through the doctors. And then when we got to the opening ceremony, they started playing music and there was noise and there was lights and there was everything. And it got too much. You know, it is, it brought the, the, so when I'm in crowds, I can't tolerate as much because I can't hear, I can't see as well as I, I do now. You know, I don't have very much now, but as soon as I lose control of that, it heightens my senses. And then to have flashing lights and loud mu music and then having the visual aspect of soldiers and that. It just brought everything back of what I had lost. You know, my service, it brought back me being in Timor, in Afghanistan. It, it reminded me of the things, the atrocious things that I had seen or the things I had done. So it was hard. It was difficult. But then when I got in to competing, I was competing people that were similar to me. So it was empowering and I felt good. I felt strong, I felt invincible, I felt confident. So my first Invictus Games where I won the most medals and felt most pride and privileged was sensational. 
And there, I had competed in two. And the reason I don't talk about the second one, which was here in Sydney, is because Sydney lost its focus. And it lost its focus because it was about winning. And what happened is we were all down in Sydney, we were preparing, it was raining. And when it was raining, we couldn't do our athletics training as much. And they put us on to this oval and I got onto the oval, started running and I ended up getting a grade one or two hamstring tear. And I did everything I could to recover from it, you know? And this is a day out or two days out before competing. I was seeing physio every three hours. I had compression packs, I had ice packs, I had everything. And I was that committed to recovering. I also had the opportunity to go up the Sydney Harbour Bridge with Prince Harry. And I said, I can't do it. I give up. I'm not doing it. I've got to recover. And they said, you understand what you're missing? I went, I don't care. I'm here to compete and to make myself proud again. You know. And what took away from Sydney was this me recovering was going to the first game. I was walking down to cheer on my team. They were competing in um, rowing. And as I was limping, walking down there, one of the um, officials caught up to me and said, oh, Michael, what's going on in that? And um, I said, oh, I've torn my hamstring, so I've pulled out of the rowing and I'm recovering. And he goes, oh, how, how are you going to do your limpy? Oh, how are you going to do your swimming? How are you going to, how are you going to do your your running or your athletics and said i'm going to compete in what i can compete and just take it easy through everything else he goes that's not the invictus spirit and i felt gutted i felt pissed off i went down and watched the game and i had to walk out and i went and spoke to one of the athletics managers or one of the managers and said this is what this prick said and and annoyed and it got to me so my first race was swimming and i was with my partner at the time and my daughter was down there too so i competed in swimming the best i could with a torn hamstring i wasn't kicking i tried not to kick and i i didn't win medals and it wasn't about medals but i competed but what people didn't see was because of that wanker i'd finished the swimming limping I have to go out the back, have to get it retorn or restrapped, get up ice because of the hamstring, because I would either kick or because I couldn't get out of the pool. And then I'd be in the physio and then I'd get ready for the next race and then I'd compete. And because of him and me not being able to do as strong as I was, and I wasn't winning the medals because they had a focus on winning medals, I felt I wasn't to that standard. And then I was getting ready. Um, oh, sorry. So before swimming, I actually had cycling. And when I was in the cycling, I tore it further because I, I was trying to compete. And then I, because I, I heard it, I couldn't, I just kept going around and I lost and I lost hope. And I, and I was on pain meds and all this stuff. And then when I got to swimming and that. So by the time I had finished swimming, I walked out. I, I can't remember what event it was in. And I was there with my wife or my partner at the time and my daughter and she was in tears. She goes, why are you doing this? Why? I said, I need to, I need to, I need to, you know, not let it get to me. I need to prove this guy wrong. And my partner turned around and goes, you're hurting yourself. I went, I know I'm trying not to. I'm not kicking. I'm not doing this. And she was upset. And I said, I promise I won't. I'll pull out of this race and that. Anyway, the time we finished that conversation, seeing her, how hurt she was, we were in athletics. And when I got to athletics, I started my runs and I started run and I said I wasn't going to compete. I did the runs, but I didn't compete. But as soon as you're in that field and you're on that line, as soon as I took off on the 400, I felt my hamstring again. And I just walked around or I jogged around and I didn't compete, like I said to her, but I felt my hamstring. So I think I never, like we spoke, but she never said anything to me afterwards and I knew I was wrong. And then I got to long jump and I got introduced to this child. His name was not, not Gibson, I think. And um, he was similar to me. He'd lost his arm in a, a lawn mowing accident and all that stuff. And 
I had a Canadian, another guy or something, and we're sitting there talking. I said, do you mind if this got kid jumps for me? I can't jump. He goes, if you understand, if he jumps for you, he'll take your points. And I went, I don't care. And we went up to the marshalling area. And they said, he can't jump for you. He's not recognized. I said, this is wrong. I can't jump. I will jump with him or whatever. And goes, and the other two gentlemen said, if he wants to jump for him and take the points, let it be. Who cares? Anyway, we went down to the start line and there were still people against it and all this stuff anyway the only way for us to jump was for me to run with him i said well mate i'll run with you you jump so the sydney invictus game as far as i'm concerned has bad memories because of one individual which affected me affected my family because i let it you could say but because the whole games had lost its purpose and spirit what is the purpose of the Invictus Games as you see then? What should it be? It should be about enabling and encouraging people to defeat those labels I speak about. So it doesn't matter if the person isn't able to get down to a game or to a training event and when he gets there, he's been drinking a lot of alcohol, which had happened, and kick him off. It's not about that. It's about, mate... We need you to come down again because he did get down there. How he got down there was his coping strategy, but making him realize, well, you can keep coming, but you need to reduce it, not kick him off the team. So to me, Invictus is about enabling people to face the barriers. It's enabling them to achieve what they can't achieve. Enabling them to say, come to a camp. Allowing them face the fears. If they can compete, let them compete at their level building on the hope if they had torn a hamstring accept what they have said because they have faced so many barriers to get where they were so it's about enabling and encouraging and a lot of people do that like i said it only takes one person to destroy something or it takes a handful of people or the focus changes to goals or changes to something else and not realizing and focusing on individual and the family what do you think about Prince Harry and what he's set up with the Invictus Games? Did you actually get to meet him? Um, yeah, I've met him a couple of times. Um, definitely, I, I can't. I do remember, you know. Oh, that's yeah, yeah, that's right. So I met him in passings, and then the time I met him was in Canada. In Canada, when I had my relapse, like I said, I couldn't handle the initial ceremony, and they took me to a quiet room. And when I was in the quiet room, once again, I felt guilty and ashamed. And I said, I need to get back out to the team. My partner at the time saw what I was going through. So she came down and I said, okay, I've got to get out. So I staged, I said, all right, I'm going to walk from here to here. So I did that and she encouraged me. We got to a certain point. My partner couldn't come any further. I walked to the next point. When I got to that next point, a security guard said, oh, mate, you need to move. And I said, mate, you can fuck off. I don't need to go anywhere. Not realizing it was Harry's bodyguards or security, whatever you wanted to say. <laughs> anyway, Harry ended up coming up and talking to me and just going, mate, you know, it's all good, blah, 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 you know. And yeah, so that's when I got to meet him. And then, What were your impressions when you met him? Oh, look, to be honest, I was going through enough of my own emotions. He just seemed like a genuine guy. You put your hand on your shoulder and go, you're doing good, all's fine. At the time, I think I felt comforted, but I was just focusing on trying to get back out. Um, he seemed genuine. I understood what the, you know, the guys or the security were trying to do, but I didn't care. But he did the right thing. With what Harry's done, do you think he's done a good thing with the Invictus Games? 100%. And, um, you know, he has the name, he had the label and all that stuff to really get the society, nation, globe to understand and appreciate and build on what the knowledge of veterans are. But it's just not the Invictus Games. You know, you've got other charities, you know, you've got the Warrior Games that do the same thing. They just probably don't have the title or the the global effect. Well, there are organizations in Australia that try to do the same thing, but once again, I do think some purpose has been lost. But yeah, it did have and has the effect that he achieved and wanted. What do you want to achieve on the sporting field? What's uh, the goal? What do you want to go and do next? I have no desire to be competitive anymore. I can honestly say that last Invictus took it out of me. I honestly can say that Sydney Invictus took away some hope because of what I learned. 
it wasn't just that. It was the fact that I came to a point in my life where I actually appreciated my partner and I appreciated my children. And I appreciated where I was with my work and when I was with myself. And I wanted to build on that. And I just wanted to enjoy cycling. I just wanted to enjoy kayaking. I just wanted to enjoy it. And because I was getting older and felt what I had felt and feeling that, you know, I wasn't so much of a veteran anymore and I had different pursuits, I actually just want to enjoy competing or just going for a swim or doing a triathlon, just getting out and doing it. There's more satisfaction just doing it than just winning medals and things like that. And which it reminds me, you know, like when I was trying for the uh, Paris swimming you know, like I said to you, you know, I've got multiple conditions and, and sensory physical. And one of the ways for me to get on the upper class or that up on the next level was to amputate one of my three fingers because it's fused. And I was seriously thinking about it, amputating my finger to be seen competitive. So in a way, I'm glad I don't because I now realize what that finger offers me, which is stability when holding a cup. But when you start looking at, you know, that's how competitive of I was, how I wanted to be seen. So I'm glad I didn't get my third finger amputated. I'm glad that I've learnt what I've got. But I just want to be able to get out and cycle and be safe and run and enjoy the competition. Of course, I'm going to have that competitive streak. It's never going to be lost. But, but is that hard-ass approach, the hard-ass Sergeant Lydiard, is that what got you through so much though it has 100 percent. you know um i remember catching up with a friend or running into a friend him or his wife and they said oh we just thought you're arrogant we thought you're always arrogant as a sergeant or corporal and things and i said it's self-preservation and then he turned around and he said it's probably got you through where you are today and i said you're right i said i was never arrogant i was it's pride and it's strong belief of who i am and what my goals are and what achieve are and that's what's helped me to get me to where i am today so by me going out and just competing and getting the position that i get will be satisfying enough because for me to achieve that means i've achieved enough to say that i've settled in brisbane because I haven't settled in Brisbane. I haven't found that comfort in competing or I haven't found that comfort in someone. Because I do want to, you know what? There's, there's nothing worse living life alone. I've got amazing children, you know? I had a great partner. But I want to be able to share my enthusiasm. I want to share my motivation. I want to be able to do what they want to do. But I want them to do what I enjoy too. I want to, you know, it's funny... Things that you learn, you're talking about relationships. At uni as an occupational therapist, they talk about intimacy and relationships. It's a big thing, you know. People undervalue the importance of relationships. And, you know, there's four um, elements to a relationship or a loving relationship. Commitment, passion, communication, trust. Um, and the last one, oh, I forget. But you've got these four or five elements. And I definitely build on it. You know, if you don't have trust, if you don't have intimacy, and I, I want it. And I want to build on it with someone. You can't do it alone. But you know, to go out cycling or just to go out to the pub and out have a meal with someone and have a genuine conversation, enjoy the, the touch or the comfort of someone or being able just to hold someone's hand in public or down the street or just being able to hold someone and enjoy a movie, I miss. And I probably long for it more because I've lost it. I lost it from you know my injuries. I can't feel as much, and I love holding hands, and I, I I like being passionate. You say you don't feel like a veteran. It's a pretty big call because you're one of the most honourable veterans that I've had the privilege of meeting. Mm. Once again, you know it comes down to my dynamics. It's come down to my past, my life course, life changes. You know, I say that very lightly that I don't feel like a veteran because I have a lot of veteran friends and I have a lot of strong veteran friends because I've achieved a lot and I have a lot of veteran friends that try to achieve a lot which are very inspirational too everyone all my veteran friends are inspirational but I guess what I mean is the thing that sits back is I remember going to an Anzac day 
with my dad, my uncle, who was a veteran as well, and my oldest son. And we went to this Cairns RSL. Anyway, I went in sitting with them and I was ob observing as I am and people looking at me, watching me and would you just like a beer or go and get a beer? And, you know, some veterans, oh, we'll buy you a beer, you know. I'd walk back and I'd, people were looking at me and just taking it on. You know, I know, I, I think I know why they're looking at me. Oh, wow, look at him, you know, he's achieved so much. And you look at the positives of things. You don't look at the negatives. You don't think of the scars. Anyway, I'm just accepting it, taking it in. And, you know, regardless, I'm accepting it. However, as we were driving back to where my partner was, my oldest son said, Dad, why was everyone watching you? I said, what? He goes, every time you got up and got a beer, people looked. Every time you were eating or tried to, you know, have what you were doing, people were watching or they seemed to talk. And I said to him, mate, because the, 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 they're probably respectful of me, they're probably proud or whatever. I said, and he turned around and said, do you think that because they don't know what to say or because they're ashamed? And I said, I don't think so. I don't think it's that at all. I think it's because they're proud of me. Anyway, that hurt. That, that really hurt to see my son at the time, 15, to realise that people in my own community, my, old, my own culture, were staring. They didn't come up and talk to me. They made me feel or made my son feel ashamed. So I called up my father and I called up my uncle. I said, did you just realise this? And they went, yep, we saw it. But no one came up and said anything to you. They just watched. I went, right. So we drove back down to Townsville on Sunday. I went shopping with my son. And he goes, Dad, why are you wearing glasses in the shopping center? I said, I oh, know, that's what I just do. And he turned around and he said, is it because of what happened on Anzac Day? And I went, yeah. I said, every time I go into the community, I'm either wearing glasses or wearing sunglasses to hide my visual scars because I feel that my kids will be ashamed. My kids will be pointed out. I will be pointed out. So after that Anzac experience, I stopped wearing my medals. And as an OT, working with DVA, working with defense members and working with civilians and you know everyday people, you listen to their stories, you're empathetic about the stories, you treat them as individuals. And you hear the modern soldier talk about their difficulties and how they want compensation for this, how they want compensation for that. You hear veterans saying that they can't get into society, they can't do things. I get it. I honestly get it. And then I met this couple, Defence, and she was struggling. And she had a Defence partner and he was, you know, DVA, didn't want to, couldn't work, couldn't do anything, which I respected. However, she was burnt out. She had her own PTSD, depressive, anxious issues. They also had a child. And they or she had to manage the child, pick up from school, bring home from school, do the homework because he couldn't do it. And I said, let me help you. Let me get you some household services. Let me get you in there. And he goes, oh, my husband doesn't like it. No one can come into the house. And I went, no, this isn't about him. This is about you. We will do it. And I had to go and speak to him. So I felt I'm not a veteran because I feel that some people let the conditions define them. My conditions define me, but I choose to what degree. And it's freaking hard. And the reason I say I'm not a veteran is one, because of that Anzac experience. Two, because the way that veterans treat each other, the way that the community looks at veterans, and because the way that veterans don't want to look after themselves. And one of the, the most important things I had ever learned through the army was self-aid. You know, as soon as you're shot or as soon as something goes wrong or you twist the ankle, you need to give self-aid first before first aid. In the heat of the battle, you're not always going to have someone come to you. It's about you putting your patch on. It's about you helping yourself. There is no difference in what we do today. And I pride myself on that. I give aid to myself first. I try to help people understand that and the veterans and, you know, even civilians to understand that this is us. We need to face it. 
and they keep pushing back. I can't, I can't. Well, Nero hack it, you can. I say it lightly, I don't feel like a veteran because I, I know I'm a veteran, but I, people, you know, I've had veterans comment about me, oh, you're lucky you don't have PTSD or you don't have this. And I take it, but they don't have no idea. They've got no idea at all what I tolerate. At the same time, you know, I've got veterans that go, wow, you know, incredible, you inspire me. So my thing is, Sometimes I don't because I feel like a health professional trying to preach and trying to encourage and coach them to feel what and help them to feel some form or some level. I'm not saying that veterans or civvies have to go back to the norm. I'm just saying that they need to support the family. They need to do a little bit more for them and to realize what legacy they want to leave behind. To me, a lot of the times they embellish on things to make sure they get the compensation they want. We all have to fight for something, but the compensation system shouldn't have to tell us to embellish. It should be accepting of and have a better empathetic understanding of what we endure. How do you celebrate Anzac Day these days then? Well, this is the first Anzac. <laughs> this year was the first Anzac um, I spent with Mason and my daughter wearing medals. Last year, we were all on COVID, but I was with my partner at the time. I just walked out by myself and stood there not wearing medals. I spoke to this gentleman and he just said, oh, you're in the med you were in the army? Why aren't you wearing medals? I said, oh, I just don't feel it, mate. You know? But this year was special because I had my daughter, I had Mason, and we marched, you know? So I, I felt proud, um, pride then because I was with my son and daughter, you know. I had a good mate with me too. I had a good mate, you know. So I did feel pride when I did it then. So this ends out was special. Let's hope there's many more. And if the chat with you is not inspirational and teaching to... A lot of people, I just don't know what is. You are an absolute inspiration. And Michael Lydiard, thanks for joining us over the bonnet. Cheers, mate. I really do appreciate it. Top.